Okay, little one. If you will, tell us your name. Brittany. Moore. <coughs> Brittany. Most of the people know me as Brittany Hovis, though. All right, Mama. Tell us your name, please. Tracy. Okay, little one. Tell me your name, please. Um, Kendra. Kendra. Kendra, how old are you? Uh, 13. Are you still in school? Yeah. What grade are you in? Seventh. Brittany, where'd you grow up? Uh, Kings Mountain. I lived with my mom. Uh, she was a single parent. Uh, my grandma and grandpa always helped her take care of me for the most part. Um, but she did most of it on her own. So you were raised in a single parent home? Yeah. My dad passed away when I was seven from cirrhosis of the liver. You um, have, uh, he was in prison when he died, when, when they transferred him to the hospital. You uh, have siblings? No, I'm sister? an only child. Were you loved as a child? Yeah. You had a good upbringing? Yeah. I was, I was raised right. Um, I was sheltered a lot as a kid, but I mean, it was all, I think my mama meant well by sheltering me. Are you married? You got kids of your own? Um, I got two kids. I'm not married. Um, I'm in a relationship that I've been in for a year now. Um, I'm divorced um, and I have two kids. My daughter's 13 and my son will be seven. Your mother has uh, gone into addiction. You understand that? Yeah. Do you remember the first time that you thought that something might be wrong? Um, that would probably be like, like when she did live, like it was me, my little brother and my, and my mom or whatever. And we all lived together and she would go to work and went and come home for hours at a time. Like she would come home at like midnight and she got off at like nine o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's very unusual of her because before she would go to work, come home, you know, tell us good night because we had school the next morning or, or I had school the next morning or like she would just come home when she was like after she got off work, but mm -hmm. then she just didn't. How old were you when, when that, when you remember that starting? Um, I think I was like eight or nine. What's your uh, favorite childhood memory? Uh, I went to Mississippi one time and I had a broke arm. It was the first time I'd ever got to go to the beach. I was 15 and I couldn't get in the water because my arm was broke. But I still had a good time because it was the first time I ever got to go to the beach. How old were you? Fifteen. You're a you're a recovering an addict. Yeah. Are you in recovery now? Yes. How long have you been in recovery? Um, I've been in recovery six months. On the seventh of January, it was six months. What was your drug of choice? Meth. Meth. Yeah. How long were you doing meth? Um, probably about four years. Um, I I tended to have a lot of I, I like to drink a lot before I started doing meth. Um, and it was, it was somewhat problemsome, but not the way that meth was. And then I quit drinking on my own and I never picked it back up. But about four or five months after I quit drinking, I started doing meth. When were you first introduced to drinking? Um, just as a kid, like socially with your friends and stuff. When just being around friends. You know, when you're young, you friends. Try How old to, were you? Probably about 16. 16. Yeah. I think most kids, not all kids, but most kids, I know I did. Yeah. You know, at 15, 16. When did, uh, when were you introduced to meth? Um, when I got with one of my exes, um, we hadn't been together that long. We worked together at, um, a fish, re a fish restaurant that I was working at. And I was getting ready to move into my own house. And I was living with my mama at the time. And I was waiting to be approved. And I just started taking him back and forth to work. And I started hanging out with him and then I just, he was around me, the people around me did it. So I eventually just gave in and tried it. We're dealing with the family today on uh, addiction and how addiction has affected the family. As a mother of a, a daughter who's an, who was an addict, how did it affect you emotionally? Well, I didn't like not being in control of something. Not being able to control what she did. Mm -hmm. You know, my son, you know, won't, they want me to go call and check on her because I couldn't see him for a couple of days. And I'm like, you just do not understand what's going to happen if I walk in that house and I find my son dead. Right. 
you know, so the effects that it had on had on me, he's in himself is in the process of recovery. Yeah. You know, it's and it's larger spread than what most people think that it is. Yeah. But emotionally, spiritually, it's had a great deal of effect on us. Were you able to talk to your friends or family or anything about this? Um, well, I didn't really talk to my friends about it. I talked to, like, my grandma about it, and I did talk to my mom at one point about it. But other than that, I just didn't really say anything about it. You live with your grandmother? Yes. So you weren't able to share, you pretty much had to carry this by yourself, that something was wrong? Did you know what was wrong? Um... Not really until my mom, like she got in an apartment or whatever. Um, and then she eventually told me after my grandma found out like that she was doing drugs. She was like, I, I'm doing drugs. She's like, you know what that is, right? I was like, yeah. Because we had learned about it like in school, like not to take that from people. Mm -hmm. Because that was like a very serious thing then too. Like people on the streets could be like here. So you learned that from your grandmother that your mother was. And that's something they're teaching in school now. Back, back when I was in school, it was called the D.A.R.E. program. Is that what it's called now? I don't know what it's called, but, I mean, my, my grandma and my mom have always been like, if you see anybody on the street trying to give you candy, don't take it. How long did you do meth? For four years. For four years. Yeah. How, explain to me, what is that? Is that something that you smoke? Is it something? Um, you can do it different ways. Um, I started off snorting it. Um, and... That's how I did it for a long time, and then I smoked it for a long time. And then right there at the end of my addiction, um, when I was in it full, like, full-fledged junkie, I guess you would call it, um, I was an injector. I was an IV user for a while. Mm -hmm. Only for about a year, though. My last year I was. How did you support your habit? Um, stealing. Um, I would... Hang out with people that would do it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't it wasn't hard to find to be a female. You just be around. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of it was stealing from people and selling the stuff I stole, or selling from stores and sell or selling it. I went to selling it for a while. Did it cause you to question that maybe maybe I could have done things that I did something wrong? Yeah, yeah. How, it did. How did it affect you that way? Just maybe thinking I was too hard of a parent. Maybe, you know, she said she was sheltered. So I, maybe I'm thinking I could have done something different, I guess. And not knowing what that was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a common reaction yeah. of, of a parent whose yeah. child is dealing with those types of... And when I say I used to drink a lot, I didn't do it in, around her. So she didn't see that mm -hmm. until she was grown. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought I was... sheltering her from seeing that lifestyle because I left her daddy so she wouldn't grow up in that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Is it dangerous? Is it a dangerous lifestyle? Yes, very dangerous. And I think one of the hardest things to get away from is the lifestyle. I was more addicted to the lifestyle than the drug, I think. I understand that. Being self-employed, I, I would do what they call multitasking. Right. And so doing, you get to set yourself in that certain pace is what you're talking about, lifestyle. Right. So what was your typical day like back then? Um, when I first started or when I was at, because it depended on, I mean, once I became homeless, my typical day would be I would wake up. Well, if I slept, the day would start. Uh, most of the time I hadn't slept. Um, I spent my days more trying to find my next high than I did anything else. It was like I would chase it, I would find it, and then I would start chasing it again. I would be worried about what I was going to do to get it before I started feeling bad again. So the drugs made you homeless? Yeah. Well, the actions caused for my drugs made me homeless. How long were you in the street? Um, at least two years. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in the street for like three years, three and a half years. Most people don't even know that. I mean, and I wouldn't actually, sometimes, you know, I would, I would bounce from couch to couch to couch. But, I mean, there are sometimes I would sleep outside. Most of the time I always had somewhere to lay my head, but it wasn't. Like, I would just, it was like until somebody ran me off. Like, I, I could be dropped off at my parents' house or my mom's house, and then the person that dropped me off would never come out and get me. So then I'm stuck trying to figure out where I'm going to go now.
How did the habit affect your life? Badly. I went from having everything to losing everything in the matter of months. Mm -hmm. I still had a house for a while, but it was because it was government funded and the lady that ran it gave me chance after chance after chance, but I didn't have anything else. I didn't have my kids, I didn't have my car. I didn't have myself, really. I didn't have nothing. Did you have friends? Yeah, the ones that were wanting something off of me or the wrong kind of friends. Right. Have you ever overdosed? No. You ever know anybody that overdosed? Yes, I've saved a couple of lives myself. How did you do that? Um, I learned how to do CPR on the phone with 911 when somebody that I was close to overdosed. And they were in the hospital for five days on an Narcan drip after that. I was very upset about it. I mean, I feel like I had a right to be because, you know, that is my mom and nobody should ever even have to go through that. Um, and I, the thing that, about that, though, is like I would hide my emotions around my mom. I wouldn't, you know, show any emotion. I'd act like everything was okay. And then when she would leave, I would sit there and cry in my grandma's arms, like after. Right. Because your mom was leaving or because you knew she was struggling? Both. Because I knew that I, like after she left, I probably wouldn't see her for about a week or two. Mm -hmm. And then also that like she did start that. She had a decision whether she wanted to or not, and she did. I pretty much knew immediately she was something was up. Mm -hmm. like she lived with me, and then she moved out. And got her own place, but I mean, she lived with me and was just, you know, she met that guy and was hanging out with him and didn't want to come home, would be over there like, she would want to go hang out and hanging out after work is, you know, two or three hours, but she wouldn't want to come home at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not dumb. I did know something, but you know, they're not going to tell you right away till they have to. So she was avoiding you. Oh, yeah. 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 No, and I, I mean, nobody I wants to tell that. their parent, hey, I'm on meth. Yeah, no, I understand that. Uh, they, you know, birthday parties or Christmases, holidays. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she didn't come around a whole lot when she was an active user. Right. Like, she might come and stay an hour and she's leaving. Up to this last point where you finally came to a place of wanting to get clean had you tried to get clean before yeah um i tried on my own though i did go to detox one time um and i've been to jail one time for uh, about 30 days last year and when i went to jail i was really i was in south carolina i was really serious about wanting to try to get clean and you know stay one way but in the back of my mind i was like back and forth still mm -hmm. and it lasted i mean i was out of jail maybe a day and a half and I was back on the streets. I just couldn't, you know what I'm saying? I think of the lifestyle is what I was chasing then. But the time I went to detox, I just went to just really go, I guess. I don't know really. Um, when I got clean this last time, I ended up going to jail, but I was at that point in my life where I was ready to get clean. I just done drugs for so long. I didn't know where to start or like, I felt like I didn't know how to live life sober again. Like it was going to be completely different. Um, I knew how to live life as a sober person. I didn't know how to live life as a sober person that has been addicted to drugs. What was the nailing down? Uh, in other words, we, we try, we fail, we try, we fail, can't get out, can't change, can't change. But then something happens. What happened? Um, I met the guy that I was with and that I'm with now. And when I met him, he had a job and a home. And even though I was still using, I had a sense of what the stability was like again. Mm -hmm. So I think when I went to jail, I was thriving to just be clean. And I got that sense of sobriety that I had been wanting. And my family had more, f I always felt like I never had anybody that had my back, but when I was using, and I know that they did, but I think in the beginning, my mom didn't understand it because she had, she dealt with my dad being an alcoholic, but it was different because I was her kid and it was a drug addiction and I gave up everything for it. Um, so I think once my family started to educate themselves on it and try to understand how hard it was for me to quit, it made it easier for me to quit. Yeah. Well, you never know if you're making the right decision. Right. No, you're right. There I mean, is you no don't. handbook. There's not a handbook. Exactly. And that's what I used to tell her all the time. I can't just open up to page 14 and see what to do today. Right. 
So you just have to live it as it comes. So it was pretty much an emotional roller coaster, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. And then her daughter would get mad, and but she wouldn't tell her. She would tell me, but if she came, if her mama came around, it would be all laughs and giggles and just spending time with her mama. But when she'd leave, she'd get mad again. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand something if you don't go through it, but. It's also hard for an addict to understand from their point of view, too, especially if they've never been through it. No, I understand that. I mean, how can somebody like, I know how if it, they've never been there? Yeah, like I know how it affected me as a kid, my dad being an alcoholic and dying from alcohol, but I don't have a child that's an addict. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I never have, so I don't understand that. And my daughter watched everything change right in front of her. So, you know, and then my son went from living at home with his mama, having his own room to living at home with his daddy, having to share a room, not knowing why, You're not knowing why he can't be around his mama. What's the difference in your mindset that that there's a hope, uh, that there's a, a possible a future? Well, I feel like when I went to jail and I wasn't, I feel like I've worked too hard to turn right now. Mm -hmm. Even though I did it in jail and I was made to go to rehab, it's like I've done got so far and to my family being proud of me and me being proud of myself that I don't have, you know what I'm saying? I have too much to lose. Yeah. I have too much to lose to, to, to compare, go back. Compare me that to where um, where you were. Well, before I just felt like, I don't really know how to explain it. Um, I mean, I was on the streets. I didn't care about my nobody. But I mean, I really didn't care about myself. They say, you know, people on drugs are selfish. But really, we're that way because we don't care about ourselves. We don't care if something's happened. You know what I'm saying? I've had guns put in my head and... Just, I've put myself in some dangerous situations. I put, I mean, I put my family in dangerous situations and didn't even live with them, you know. Um, but now it's just like I look back on all that and I still wouldn't have changed me being an addict because it's made me who I am. Mm -hmm. I've learned from it. As a kid growing up, I was selfish. I was ungrateful. Nothing you could do would please me. And then when I got on the streets and became homeless, I realized how grateful I was for something as simple as being able to take a shower being able to have something to eat, knowing where I was going to lay my head at night. Let me ask you, how did it affect you emotionally? I mean, just like the thought of like not having my mom in my life. Like, I just did not want to have her in my life. So I feel like that, like I felt like when my grandma got custody of me, I just thought like my mom didn't want me or that my, like, I don't really know how to explain it. Like my mom had to like kind of give up at that right. point. She had to give it all up to my grandma. I mean, I think you expressed it very well. Did uh did you try yourself personally? Did you try to reach out to your mama? I feel like when she first started I tried to, but over the years I just didn't really cuz I knew she like it's kind of like upsetting when you like don't want to tell your mom things. Cause she, you either know she's gonna get upset about it, or she's gonna be like, "I know I've tried," mm -hmm. because it is hard to try, and I do understand that. Like, I know it's hard to after you've been on something for so long, it takes a while to like get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't want to hurt her feelings, so I feel like I didn't really tell her things. How can parents? How can they help their children? How can they help their children in the midst of this? When you found out. What could we do to help them to overcome what it is that they're in their own hearts, their own mind, their own addiction is struggling with? What can we do to help that? I don't know if there's anything you can do. I, I don't know. I think that's a good answer. Yeah, I don't know how to. I don't know how to answer that because yeah. every situation is probably different, mm -hmm. and everybody, everybody says, um, "Don't enable them. Don't enable them." I didn't, but she still did it. I mean, it wasn't because I was helping her do it, but she still did it. What would be the worst thing for the child? What should we not do? Put up with it. I mean, I, I made her leave because I'm not living like that. She chose the life. I didn't. I was just going to always be an addict. Honestly, I think what it was is when I went to jail this last time, 
I got a letter from my daughter telling me how proud she was of me and how she wanted me to change and how she wasn't going to believe me unless I showed it to her. And that letter hit, hit something in me when I was in jail that just, it changed me. Yeah. And that was the day I was like, I got too much to live for. Well, let me ask you, what's your biggest fear? Relapse. Well, relapse into a point where I, I, I'm back to where I was. Because everybody, I feel like everybody has slip-ups and everybody fails, but full-blown relapse is what scares me the most. Because they I do. feel like if I was to ever relapse that much, I wouldn't come back out of it. As a young teenager, what would your, what would your greatest fear be? My mom overdosing. And I, that is extremely common for those that are dealing with loved ones who are uh, recovering or in addiction. When I was in rehab, I was, I had my mindset, I was, I'm going to do this. When I get out, I'm going to stay clean. In the back of my mind, I was always afraid that I wouldn't be able to. Mm -hmm. Like when it come closer time for me to get home. And once I got home, I was more scared because I'm out in the world now. You know, when I'm in rehab, of course, you're going to stay clean. When you're rehab, you ain't got a choice. But then once you hit that sense of freedom and you're like, now, you now what choice. do I do? Now I have to, yeah, now I have to do it on my own. Yeah. And if you had a word of advice for those who may be, you know, some, they got peer pressure friends trying to encourage them in this direction to maybe go meth or fentanyl or whatever the stuff is on the street. Now, what would be your word of encouragement? One toward the drug. But then what would be your encouragement for those who think they cannot change? Um, I feel like even people who don't have family and feel like they don't have too much to lose, they do because they lose their self. And at the end of the day, we can only control our own actions and everybody is their own worst enemy. So you got to get on your own side because even if... You do have a support system. I mean, like me, I have a bunch of people that love me. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't love myself. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, nobody can do it but you. And people that... The streets is not your friend. People that you meet on the street, they're not your friend. Um, I do have some friends that I'm... People that I'm friends with now that I met on the street that are sober. And I'm still friends with them now because we're both sober. Um, but... People who influence you to do drugs or, you know, do things that you're not supposed to, they're not your friends. They're, they don't care nothing about you or if, you know, if you're dead or alive, they don't. Um, the biggest thing I think is, which also is the hardest thing, is to put yourself into a detox facility and actually going through with it. That's one of the hardest things you can do because especially a lot of people who do fentanyl or heroin, they, they go through a physical sickness that people that do meth go through an emotional sickness. It's, it's a different kind of, of detox and, and it's harder, you know what I'm saying? But I never understood why people would go through all this to get through detox and then turn around and go back until I was in it full fledged. Um, I can't really, I can't really say, you know, go get help because that's what people, all people say that, you know what I'm saying? But you have to truly want it for mm -hmm. it to work. If you don't want it and you go for somebody else, it's not going to do you any good. You have to really just be done and over with it. You have to be done. It's harder to be in recovery than it is to be an addict. It's hard work. Um, I'm just really glad that I'm at a place now where my family is still here. Um, my grandparents are still alive. You know what I'm saying? They were alive to see me get myself clean. I didn't wait until I lost some of the people that were close to me to, to choose to do, do so. And a lot of people do. Um, I've been through more in the last four years than I probably have in my entire life mm -hmm. as far as trauma. And it's a lot. It's, it's, it's hard to come out of, but I guess I realize what the true meaning of what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger really means because I do feel like I'm a stronger person. I feel like I can take on, you know, bigger trials and tribulations than what I could have before. Mm -hmm. um, before my mom, I always fixed all my problems for me. Now I don't run to her to fix all my problems. I either fix them myself or 
if you know if I don't think it's worth fixing, I just move on. Um, but if I can do it, anybody can, because I I really thought my life was not going to be the way I was. I had accepted the fact. I always say that accepting. They say acceptance is a good thing. Accepting you have a problem is the first step. But accepting that you have a problem is also the worst step because once you accept it, sometimes you just you accept you it. accept it. If you were talking to other teenagers out there whose parent is in an addiction, what would be your advice to other teenagers that are wrestling or going to be wrestling with what it is that you've come through? Um, just don't give up on them. Mm -hmm. Like, be there for them, whether they made you mad or disappointed you or not. Because they probably, you got to think of their emotion too. They probably feel like they could have done better. And they feel like that they've, like, disappointed you or failed you or anything like that. If they say acceptance is a good thing. Accepting you have a problem is the first step. But accepting that you have a problem is also the worst step. Because once you accept it, sometimes you just you accept, you it. accept it. I feel like even people who don't have family and feel like they don't have too much to lose, they do because they lose their self.